There are certain points in life where you decide to get better car, better camera, better audio equipment or better wife. Today it's about audio equipment, about power amplifiers to be more specific. And to be exact, it's about this Yamaha V3. She is one of a few VFET amplifiers out there and on top of that she can be bridged to a monoblock. I'll explain what it means later. I've heard and read nothing but praise for these amps, something like best sounding solid states ever, there's nothing better than this, it's a musical bliss, etc etc. All these bollocks made me interested, so I've bought these amps from Japan and as you may have noticed, they are a bit damaged. I don't want to be mean on anything, but the bloke who sent them must have been mental. He put the amps in a carton box without any protection whatsoever, no foam, no bubble wrap, nothing, just the bloody box. If he had put a sticker with my address directly on the amps, it wouldn't make any difference and he could have spared some time by not packing them at all. As you may see, thanks to that, they arrived in a sorry state. I'm surprised they even work. Anyway, I'm gonna stop this rant and crack on. What's so special about her, you ask? Well, apart from the fact she looks like a backup power supply or a small eater, it's got VFAT transistors, you can pair the power amp with another one. She was limited only for Japanese market and she's supposed to be some kind of holy grail of amplifiers. Let me first explain what power amplifier is. Everybody usually knows what a receiver or integrated amplifier is. What is power amplifier then and why would I use it instead of more convenient integrated amplifier or receiver? Integrated amplifier is essentially a preamp with power amp integrated into one chassis, like this Yamaha CA2000 of mine. Preamp is the part that includes inputs, outputs, volume, some tonal adjustments like bass or treble, and some minor amplification. Power amp only amplifies the signal, that's basically it. On the receiver is a preamp, power amp, and tuner in one chassis. By making power amp a separate device with its own separate power supply usually makes them far superior to integrate it in terms of sound quality because there was no compromise when they were building the amp. When creating an integrated amplifier there usually needs to be some sort of compromise. Yamaha B3 is a standalone power amp which is supposed to be connected to a preamp but it's not necessary to make it work in. Without the preamp you're stuck with just one input and this power level knob. Which is perfectly fine for someone who needs to connect his DAC, meaning DAC, or any other signal source that's able to control the volume if you need it. Sure, you can lower the volume with these ports on the amp, but I wouldn't use it at all because it kinda degrades the quality of the output and we don't want to degrade sound quality of the Holy Grail, do we? You can't, however, connect directly any device you want. For example, your record player needs a phono preamp or the phono preamp needs to be integrated into the record player itself, otherwise it won't work. You have to be a bit careful if you're connecting your source directly without a preamp. If you don't use these level ports and your source is at maximum volume level, the amp is sending maximum power out and they could be pretty much fatal for your loudspeakers, your ears or your poor cat sleeping on your speaker. You may be familiar with the saying, there's no preamp like no preamp, though it may be true for some preamp power amp combinations, very good preamp may add some depth and quality. However, I want to know how this amp sounds without any additional interventions, so I've decided to test her with no preamp. Unlike the CA2000 which is class A switchable to class AB, B3 is purely class AB. Class A is considered being the best for audio reproduction, it uses maximum power all the time even when the amp is producing zero output which is better for distortion but highly inefficient. The wasted energy is then converted to heat. Class AB on the other hand is far more efficient with little to no sacrifice to distortion and thus sound quality. As you've probably guessed before B3 there was B2 and before that B1. There were actually two more, BX1 and B2X, but they haven't got VFAT transistors so I'm not gonna include them here. B1 was released in 1974, B2 in 1976 and B3 in 77, so they weren't so much apart. B3 is the last Yamaha's attempt to conquer the market with something different, something special, but it lasted only for 4 years. It was a very short production and after that Yamaha switched to MOSFET. But why? What was the reason? Were these amplifiers so terrible that Yamaha had to end the production? Well, let's start from the beginning. Right from the start, I'm not sure it was the first, Yamaha or Sony. Both of them came out with their first VFA amplifier in 1974. Sony with their integrated amplifier TA8650 on Yamaha with their V1. Both of these delivered such an incredible sound, couple of other companies jumped on this bandwagon and released their own VFA amps. 
JVC came out with JMS7 power amp on JPS7 preamp. Sansui with BA1000 power amp, Hitachi with the HA500F. Since all of the MRs v were power amplifiers, they needed little sisters to make them complete. C1 preamp was made for B1 power amp. She was offered powered with v only in some stages and she's considered to be one of the best preamps till this day. Unlike with the B3, Yamaha nailed the design of both of these devices. They just look cracking. Then came out B2 and along with a C2 which already dropped the v transistors and became considerably smaller. One year after the release of B3, Yamaha didn't release C3 but rather C2A for some reason. It looked almost the same as C2 but it was much better. But apparently there was still room for some improvement and the ultimate C2 version called C2X was released in 1985. VFET or SIT transistors were developed by this bloke, Nishizawa Junichi, known as Mr. Semiconductor. And rightly so, not only he was pretty good at his job, he was so obsessed with it, he was actually thinking about naming his son after a transistor. On as in being a Japanese, there were only Japanese companies utilizing VFET in their product. Yamaha, Victor, known as JVC outside of Japan, Sansui, Sony, Hitachi and maybe Pioneer. Unlike Yamaha, JVC and Hitachi, Sony also produced integrated amplifiers with VFET transistors. I'd like to get my hands on all of those one day, but for now let's crack on with the B3. It's one of Yamaha's milestones as they present on their website. As lots of other Japanese audio equipment, Japanese kept these just for Japanese market. They had to keep the best bass for themselves, minja bastards. About 5,000 units were made and they were sold for 200,000 yen, which is something like 2,500 quid or 3,500 dollars in today's currency. I wanted to get some information online, but it's practically impossible to find some, except for this brochure and very brief article on Yamaha's website. How typical. Why did Yamaha end the production so early then? There were probably more reasons to that, as usual, main reason was money. VFET transistors were much more expensive to manufacture than newly appeared MOSFET, and Yamaha just abandoned better for cheaper. I may do a single video about VFET in the future, but I'll make it short this time. It was very difficult to work with VFET, they needed very reliable power supply and could get very hot, and there may have been another reason for ending the production. She is perhaps nothing you want to own. Or at least you don't want to look at her. Why would a company that created this piece of art produce this? Maybe it's for practical reasons? Maybe we'll find out later when I take her apart. There's nothing special about the front panel. There's a power switch, a power LED indicator, BTL LED indicator and these two level knobs. That's pretty much standard for any power amp. They don't need anything else. What is not standard, however, to have the same level knobs on the back panel as well. I wasn't sure what they were supposed to do, so I had to try it, obviously, and they both work the same, kind of. It behaves quite strangely. When I turned down either one or the other, it lowered the volume by 20 dB. So far, so good. But when one of them was all the way down, so the volume was lowered, the other then increased the volume even though the pot was turning to negative numbers. So, if you turn both to minus 20 dB, you get maximum volume. Makes sense. Right next to the back panel level knobs is a coupling switch. In AC mode, it's essentially a pass filter. It filters very low frequencies or lets anything above 10 Hz pass. It also protects your audio equipment against unwanted parasitic power spikes. On the other hand, no filters are perfect and DC mode should sound slightly better. It's pretty much obvious what input RCA connectors are, and here is one of the most important parts of this amp, BTL mode. BTL stands for bridge side load. It means the amplifier uses all its power only for one channel, and thus you need two of these, one for right and one for left channel to get stereo. Like this, you'll get twice the power, which is 140 watts per channel, and I wonder if this kind of setup changes sound quality in any way compared to stereo. To get the amp working in the BTL mode, you need to connect one of the channels here and flip this switch to BTL. And of course, you need to do the same with the other channel on the second amp. Speaker goes to these two terminals in BTL mode, but if you want to use the amp in stereo mode, right channel goes here, left channel here, and the switch needs to be flipped to stereo. Let's have a look inside, maybe I can find answer there why it looks how it looks. And this is the very heart of the amp, 4 VFET transistors. If you look at where the transistors are, 
you notice that the entire chassis is basically one big heating, and however ugly it may look, it makes quite effective cooler. It's a cracking design, not very appealing, but very efficient. These are improved transistors used in B2. What's so special about VFET and now they differ from other types of amplifiers then? Ever since the first transistors were used in an amplifier, there's been a raging war between two sides. Those who love the sound of valve amps, also known as tube amps in the US, and those who love the sound of transistors. There are tons of different types of transistors, and today most widely used amplifiers use MOSFET and BJT transistors. But valve amps are still considered to be a benchmark in the audio industry, but are they really? Valves sound a bit different compared to transistors. Some people prefer one over the other. Even though VFET transistors are pretty much gone today, they used to be part of Ion's audio family, and they are said to be as close to valves as transistor will come. I've never heard a VFET amplifier before, but this statement says a lot, if true. So I just went and bought a pair of these to make sure I'm not missing on anything. VFET stands for Vertical Field Effect Transistor, also called SIT, which stands for Static Induction Transistor. It's the same thing, but fancy calling it VFET, it's more common. VFET transistors' characteristics are better compared to other transistors, like lower noise, distortion, or higher audio frequency power. The sound coming out of these amps should have some unique qualities. However, they've got two serious problems. They can get too bloody hot, and they were very expensive to produce. They required reliable biosupply, otherwise they just didn't survive. Some Sony VFET amplifiers are known for being rubbish. They always blew up unless you replace some of the components immediately after the purchase. Yamaha did a much better job. As well as transistors, these caps were developed specifically for this model. And since it's no longer in production, if either of these goes this up, the amp is pretty much useless. They could, theoretically, be replaced by something new or similar, but it wouldn't sound the same. Despite it being called power amplifier, it wasn't considered to be powerful at the time of the release. It was the time when more power equaled better, and B3 wasn't particularly powerful, at least in stereo mode. Power output is either 70 watts per channel at 8 ohms in stereo mode, or 140 watts in mono mode, but it's still plenty powerful for minutes. I was a bit skeptical and didn't expect much, but to be honest, it really is brilliant. In my last amplifier review, which was Yamaha CA2000, I was quite impressed by the sound. However, the sound coming out of these amps is simply unbelievable. It's on an entirely different level. I've been using it for everything. Music, films, games, etc. And it delivers in every department. For those who have live music, this amp brings it almost literally to a realm. She just fills the room with the presence of the performer on the instruments. It's almost perfect. Is it worth having two of these in BTO mode then? To make it short, it's definitely worth it. The difference is subtle, but you can clearly hear the finer details on the individual instruments in songs are, how to put it, a bit more, a little bit more separated and more pronounced. I've also noticed it's got a deeper bass. All of these findings are, of course, subjective, I want to keep these because it really is a wonderful piece of electronics. And since the VFET transistors are no longer produced, I've even bought a third amp as a backup if one of those I've got goes up in flames. As I've read through all sorts of discussion on the net, people usually can't decide which one of those three Yamaha amps is better. I'll try to get B1 and B2 on PM against these two mingers. And of course I'd love to compare them to IPEX on other VFET as well. Until then, I'll be using these every day. I don't know how to put it, but I kind of became addicted to it. Or maybe it's more appropriate to say to the sound, I just want to listen to anything that comes out of it all the time. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. See you all next time.